Hello and welcome to this very special webcast about investing in the future of Europe. My name is Joe Lynham and I present a program on the BBC called The Newsroom and on BBC Radio 4. Before that, I was a business and economics correspondent for very many years uh, at the BBC and I covered the financial crisis and then the Eurozone crises and uh, all stories in between about business and economics. Uh, and this is probably the most worrying time and the most worrying story uh, that I have covered. Uh, tens of thousands of Europeans have died as a result of the pandemic. Millions of Europeans are either out of work or in danger of losing their jobs. And we can no longer even greet each other in the normal way of a handshake or a pat on the back, let alone a kiss on the cheek or a hug. This will probably be the worst recession since the end of the war. People need reassurance. People need to know that their politicians are on the job and that their institutions are up to doing the job. They need the comfort of knowing that there is a plan for recovery and that there are already structures in place for investment in companies and people. Today, we will be discussing what those structures are and what, what might need to change to bounce Europe back into action. We are going to ask three big questions today. You have seen it probably uh, in, in preparation for this webcast. The first one is, how can new investments be future-proofed to deliver long-term objectives as well as cushion Europe from the economic effects of the pandemic? How can the EU further enhance its financial tools over the long run to make European societies and economies thrive? And how can the EU's toolbox be strengthened to support sustainable development, foster innovation, and invest in the future of jobs for jobs of the future in years to come. We have a great panel bringing together some very senior people in the European Commission, the European Investment Bank, and a member of the Budget Committee of the European Parliament. Remember, you can also contribute to this discussion, hashtag investing in the future, but you also can contribute uh, on the right-hand side of your screen on that you'll see the live comments. So please prepare your questions. And if they are suitable and not too defamatory, I will put those to our distinguished panel. Remember, this is being recorded and this is on the record. Joining us in a few moments will be Valérie Ayer, MEP, a member of the European Parliament's negotiating team for the MFF, or the next long-term EU budget. She is part of the Renew Group uh, of the Parliament, part of uh, uh, the En Marche Group of President Macron. Thomas Östros is Vice President of the European Investment Bank. He is from Sweden and represents the Nordic Baltic Austrian part of the eight EIB Vice Presidents. Uh, hello to all of you. You've just been slided into view there. Previously, he worked for the IMF and before that, he was a Minister for Fiscal Affairs in the Swedish government. So he knows his money. Luke Tolonja is the Principal Advisor to Martin Ferve, the Director General at DG ECFIN. Uh, in the European Commission, that is the Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs, and he was in the cabinet or cabinet of the previous president, Jean-Claude Juncker. Each panelist will have two or three minutes to discuss how they see this subject developing in the next couple of years. I'd ask you all to be brief and to the point, or as the great Swedish philosophers Roxette said, don't bore us, get to the chorus. Don't forget to add your questions and your thoughts. I'm going to start with Thomas Östros from Sweden, from the European Investment Bank, with a brief introduction about what the EIB will be doing to support recovery. Thomas. Thanks, Joe. I won't be able to sing, but uh, I'll try to uh, uh, be a little bit more enjoyable than, uh, than I usually am. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So my background in this is that I started as vice president uh, at the EIB uh, in the beginning of this year. So I've had a a really uh, interesting and challenging in introduction because we have been, of course, thrown into the center of discussion on how to deal with this crisis. Before that, as you mentioned, I was minister in Swedish governments for a little bit more than 10 years and uh, also at the IMF for five years. And my career has been very much about dealing with crises. I've, I've experienced three major devastating crises as a decision maker. First, uh, the Swedish financial crisis in the early 90s, uh, a real catastrophe, catastrophe for the economy, 
we went to minus 13% of the fiscal deficit, unemployment uh, exploded. Uh, then we, of course, we have the global financial crisis that uh, caused uh, a lot of disturbance, not least in Europe, and also it was the first step into the Euro crisis. And now the COVID-19 crisis that is uh, even more devastating than much of what we have experienced before. What I've learned is that you need to tackle these kind of crises very rapidly and very forcefully because crises tend to stick otherwise, not least unemployment. We have now youth cohorts that go out on the labor market that will meet uh, massive unemployment among youngsters. And uh, that experience could be something that they bring with them for a very long time. And uh, we need to act very forcefully to see to that uh, we do not get uh, uh, the hi highest uh, 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 threat of, of, of unemployment levels. We need also to show solidarity. That is my experience from dealing with crises. If we do not protect the vulnerable, people won't be able to support uh, the measures that are needed in a crisis. And sometimes these measures are very tough and harsh. So you have to show solidarity. But the third thing is also, even you, if you are in the middle of dealing with a very acute crisis, you have to think about the future. And in this case, I think uh, the climate crisis, the more looming, slow going, but uh, uh, potentially catastrophic crisis that we have ahead of us must be dealt with at the same time as we are dealing with the short run uh, challenges. Uh, and uh, I think I have in EIB this, this spring, I've seen that we have been able to do rapid things uh, in a quite a substantial way. The first response was uh, to deliver over 30 billion in a fast response of liquidity to small and medium sized companies that was uh, in a very difficult situation. The second step was to gather our member states to form a 25 billion euro guarantee fund uh, to, to uh, be able to support companies with 200 billion of loans and guarantees uh, uh, and that we will roll out in the coming weeks. And the third step is, of course, what the, the Commission is now uh, advocating, discussing with Member States, but also discussing with the EIB, for us to do our part in the recovery. We are ready to uh, be an important player in that, in close cooperation with the Commission and, and, and Member States, uh, in uh, dealing with the invest in, invest EU, uh, in uh, uh, rolling out uh, new solvency instruments, in supporting uh, outside EU with the new Indici program, we are ready to go forward also there. And I think there must be a very strong green content in the recovery phase. Climate is our medium and long-term most important focus. And the acute crisis should be used to get us in a better place. That is my experience from Sweden from the crisis in the 90s. We took decisive measures in education, research, digitization, uh, increasing productivity. So after some cumbersome years, we ended up being an economy and a society that was actually a bit better than uh, we were uh, just before the crisis. So I think that is, I think, an important uh, experience to have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thomas, uh, from the European Investment Bank for that perspective. Let's go now to a a directly elected MEP, someone who the people have voted for, who sits on the European Parliament's Budget Committee, uh, and she holds the purse strings. Valérie Ayer. Thank you, hello everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to participate to this event uh, that gave us uh, representatives from different key Eastern institutions uh, for the European recovery. This diversity shows that the recovery process uh, is not purely and, and only economical, um, uh, but also political. The urgency compels us to make choices. First, we had to react quickly. This was done through the special program set up by the ECB from the purchase of assets. This was also done through uh, the authorization to rely upon the ESM and the setting up of the SHARP program. Uh, these are steps that would have normally, normally taken years to complete. But with the COVID-19, uh, it seems 
to modify everything, even political constraints uh, in the country, we have to, to pay. Um, the recovery instrument proposed by the Commission is another massive step forward, even if not yet perfect, from all points of view. Um, the Union already borrowed money for back-to-back -back loans to member states, but here is but here it is certainly new. The amount, the duration for the repayment, the way uh, the money is dispersed, and the objectives. We must grasp the opportunity offered by this proposal to move forward, to, to move toward a transformation of our whole economy. That is for a resilient and competitive Europe. I think. Thank you. Merci, Valérie. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, hear finally now from the European Commission, Luc Tolonia. Luc. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thomas and Valérie have said the scene uh, very well, but let me uh, try in this brief intro to recall briefly where we come from and what is at stake. Uh, the, the shock to the economy has been uh, unprecedented, as you mentioned, uh, but also we see that the recovery, even if we hope for a rapid bounce back, uh, the recovery will be incomplete and it will be very uneven across member states, across sectors, across regions. And this is a direct threat to our single market and indeed to the convergence across our union. So even if we start to see a normalization of, of, in our daily lives, um, the crisis, consequences of crisis will be with us for some time and they will be far reaching. It's not just the magnitude of a shock, uh, which is unique. It's also its very nature. It was a supply shock. It was a demand shock. It's a shock with a lot of uncertainty. And for a lot of um, actors, especially companies, that means a clear risk of fall of investment, uh, which may have uh, consequences that will drag on. Uh, Valérie mentioned it, the EU was very quick at, at uh, responding to this crisis, and indeed the toolbox has been dramatically altered over the last uh, months. If one wants to summarize, uh, we could say that there's been already three steps in this response, and possibly you could even summarize in saying one step every month. Uh, back in March, uh, when the crisis uh, arrived and the urgency became clear, the EU flexibilized all sorts of instruments, uh, the use of the structural funds, the stability and growth pact, the rules for state aid, and indeed uh, the ECB was very quick at uh, responding to the situation. And that helped member states play the role of first line of defense uh, in the wake of an uh, unprecedented crisis. The second step uh, in April, was the putting into place of three new instruments that were briefly mentioned as well. Uh, first, to help workers, the Commission uh, proposed this new SURE instrument to support short-time work schemes at national level, uh, to help member states finance extra expenditure, especially in the field of healthcare, a new credit line was created at the European Stability Mechanism. And uh, thirdly, uh, to help firms and SMEs, the EIB was also very fast at creating a new uh, pandemic guarantee fund. Valérie said it, it would have taken years otherwise to possibly arrive at this result. But these instruments are up and running now, and their firepower is equivalent to 540 billion uh, euros. Now, third step in May, uh, this was the time to prepare the details of a recovery plan, and we will focus on that in our discussion. Let me just flag three messages uh, to conclude my introduction. The first thing about the recovery plan is that it's not just about addressing the crisis and responding to the shock of a crisis. It is also about preparing for the future, as Thomas said. It is about making our union a climate neutral, digital, social, and strong global player. As President von der Leyen put it when presenting the plan, uh, next generation EU is about repair, but it's also about prepare for the future. Second message, uh, the recovery plan builds on the strength, the leverage, and the transparency of the EU framework. And that is very important for the trust and for the efficiency of these plans. At the core of it, uh, we, there will be a new recovery instrument uh, to borrow against the EU budget in the order of 750 billion euros uh, that will be activated to front load money into existing programs that have been tried and tested, but also new programs that respond to the new needs resulting from the crisis. Third and last message, uh, the recovery plan is central for a strong recovery across Europe. To back our proposal at the end of May, we also put forward an analysis of the potential impact of the plan, and it shows that the plan will be not only beneficial for the EU as a whole, but for all member states, which is an important message to pass. 
It will have significant benefits for the single market and for convergence across Europe. In short, it will benefit, it will benefit everyone. So for us, uh, from a Commission perspective, it's very important that we can make uh, rapid progress on the plan and in, on the MFF, and, that, and for that, the coming months will be crucial. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, thank you. Can I go back to Thomas and ask you, uh, if you were king of the world, or king of Europe at least, and you had no resistance and no democracy and you didn't have to consult anyone, what instruments would you like to have in order to boost the recovery? What tools would you like, apart from all the stuff you've already said, or are the stuff, are the tools that Luke has just referred to, are they enough? Are they going to do the job? Or is there any dream solution you'd love to have? Thomas. That's a great question. If you sort of could uh, avoid speaking with your citizen, what would you like to do? I think it would be a worse outcome than speaking with the citizens, actually. But, but uh, uh, the, the challenge is, I, I think, there is a factual need for more of joint European measures uh, to do it uh, more, even more forcefully going forward. But there is a hesitance among citizens uh, uh, to do it. And that is a real challenge for politicians of today. So it's. Uh, uh, I think I don't think it's worth uh, sort of calling for something that where you don't have to uh, be in a dialogue with citizens. I've been in dialogue with voters and citizens all my life, so I I, I don't like that type of uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, this is the real challenge. People are a little bit more hesitant than some of the proposals that are on the table on how to build a Europe, and I, I think that will be something that we will uh, have in on our table for many many years to come. Um, you, what you're talking about, Thomas, I, I, are you indicating that people are becoming a little bit more nationalistic in, in the wake of this pandemic? What we saw when this pandemic struck in Europe uh, in February uh, in Italy initially and then spread to the whole continent was that individual member states decided to close their borders. Now, obviously, it took time for the, the Commission to respond. But was that part of a, of a growing nationalism? Yes, I think so. And I, I think it is a bit concerning. Uh, one of the examples during the crisis, during the height of the crisis, a member state stopped uh, export of medical equipment within the European Union. Can you imagine such a thought? That would have been unthinkable before the crisis. Uh, and I think that is a, a sort of a warning bell that this uh, union must be stronger than that. And we must show our citizens that even in times of real, real devastating crises, we think about each other. And I think uh, the Commission proposal and the discussion that we have ahead of us is a very good opportunity to show citizens that we can do something jointly that is stronger than uh, the nationalistic responses we saw in some cases during the crisis. Valerie, can I bring you in here on that question of populism? You sit in the European Parliament. Uh, last uh, May, May 2019, quite a few populist and nationalist parties were elected to that parliament. Are you worried that countries will look after themselves and care less what happens to their neighbours? Valerie, either you're uh, posing for an artwork or you cannot hear me. I suspect it is uh, the latter. I'll bring in Luke. Luke. Um, you're on the policy-making side. Um, you propose things for the Parliament and the Council to think about. Uh, is nationalism a concern when you are drawing up your policies? Well, we, we, we try to look at the, the needs and we try to objectivize the situation. Uh, and we very much take into account also the diversity of situation across Europe to try and build a, a common uh, path. And, and for that, we, we also try to draw hard lessons from what's happening. I mean, what the, what the Commission has been proposing, you see, we try to learn uh, first lessons of a crisis. Uh, for instance, in the field of health, of course, there were legitimate expectations about the role for the EU, but for us EU experts, we, we very much know that the competencies of EU level in the field of health are actually quite limited. At the same time as uh, the Commission was able to do a lot of things, just think of uh, uh, the repatriation of EU citizens, the sharing of medical devices uh, through the civil protection mechanism, um, the, the work on vaccine that has started now in earnest. I mean, the EU has been able to, to do whatever it could within this quite limited competencies in the field of health. 
uh, in our proposal for the recovery plan, we do propose uh, to set up a new health program, which would be considerably boosted uh, in the future. We do propose to boost research activities uh, that will serve also to, to prepare uh, and make the EU more resilient in the future. Uh, so uh, we, we, of course, are very responsive to expectations, needs, uh, political views across Europe, but we try to chart, uh, I would say, a common future uh, focusing on the European added value. Um, thank you, Luke. The presidency, the EU presidency starts uh, in Germany today. Germany assumes the rotating EU presidency. Um, does that matter, Luke? And I'll be putting this to uh, Valerie as well. Does it matter that the largest and most influential country is now taking on the presidency of the European Council? Luke. Yeah, the role of EU presidencies uh, are very important and indeed a, a lot of work has been done uh, over the last six months to, to respond to the crisis and uh, lay the ground for a new recovery plan. Now we reaching crunch time and indeed uh, the big decisions will have to be taken uh, in a matter of weeks hopefully uh, with a European Council scheduled for 17 and 18 of July. Uh, but even if a deal uh, was to be reached then there's still a lot of work to be done by the legislator, uh, the European Parliament and the European Council to agree the more than 30 programmes that have been put forward in the context of the next multi-annual financial framework and indeed also very new programmes that have been proposed as part of the recovery plans. So we expect a, a, a full uh, agenda over the coming six months and indeed the role of the German presidency will be key to make this happen so that we can uh, start in earnest uh, as soon as possible. Valerie, are you back with us? Are you still posing for that work of art? Valerie? No, I think we have, we have major technical problems with, uh, with Valerie. Let's go back to Thomas now uh, and ask about this recovery fund. Uh, Valerie Ayer is part of President Macron's Renew Group in the European Parliament, and France and Germany have suggested uh, a recovery fund, most of which would be in the form of grants. Thomas, you come from a country which is referred to as one of the frugal four. Sweden, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands and Austria, who want most of the money to be in the form of loans. Now, I'm not asking you to speak for your country. You're here to represent the European uh, Investment Bank. But how important is that recovery fund, would you say, to get Europe back on its feet? Thomas. I think it can be potentially very, very important uh, as a joint uh, response. Uh, and I won't speak for the for the frugal four, but I do think that uh, we have to listen very carefully to uh, those countries that are hesitant and try to understand how to build a bridge uh, to them. But I, I see some worrying signs that we sort of uh, building wedges between groups of countries instead of uh, having a true dialogue. And I hope this summer will, and the German presidency uh, uh, will deliver a, a joint response. Uh, and I, I'm quite optimistic in the end. Uh, that it that will do, so it will turn out well. Uh, I'm very glad to see that the EIB seems to be given a very influential role in this, being one of the institutions to deliver the response, not least when it comes to supporting uh, companies, small and medium-sized companies, mid-caps, but also larger companies, uh, not least when it comes to energy efficiency, innovation, the whole climate uh, sphere. Uh, I think we can do a very, very good job there. We have shown with the Juncker plan earlier that we can broaden our scope, we can reach small and medium-sized companies via working through banks and uh, both, both private and public banks in, in, in member countries. Uh, and we can really support uh, a modernization of, of, of the European industry and the European small and medium-sized companies. That is, I think, very important. Commission points out to another important challenge that we have in, in front of us, because it's not only about giving credits and credit lines to companies. Some companies and quite a large share of companies are in a situation where they will also need capital injections going forward, equity, to be able to invest in the future. And here the Commission points to a new type of solvency instrument where they hope the EIB group can be part of the delivery of that. And I think that is a good way of thinking because... Tell, tell uh, us more about that, Thomas. That's very interesting because famously Europe is very unlike uh, North America. Um, European entrepreneurs go straight to their bank first or their Sparkasse in Germany or whatever it is. 
Whereas Americans go to venture capitalists and people who take a stake in your business. Tell us more about that instrument, because that's really potentially very interesting what the EIB could be doing. Yeah. And it could also help to create this uh, European capital, joint capital market that is strong and, 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 and vivid. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of, uh, of deploying resources via the EIP group where we could stimulate uh, middle uh, uh, institutions like fund, fund managers and others uh, to really inject capital into companies that are viable, they are strong, but they are now in capital need because of this period of uh, very, very hard strain on them. Um, so would you I think, think, just just to clarify for me, um, do you give the money to the financial institution and then urge them to give it to small and medium-sized companies? Or do you stand as a guarantor when those small companies go looking for equity? So the, all the details are still to be discussed. So this is the Commission's first uh, proposal and the member state has to agree to, to that before we are in the game. But we have already been working since the Juncker plan, uh, partly like this, cooperating with uh, investment funds and similar entities to see to that uh, we get capital injections into ca companies that are solid but uh, uh, in need of capital at this point of time because of the stress that are, they are under. I think this is a wise way of thinking and you can see that in the debate and you, when you speak with uh, corporates and, 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 and small and medium-sized companies that the next step will be also to discuss equity because uh, they are under tremendous pressure. Uh, now, in case anyone is is thinking that we have frozen out our, our female guest, Valérie Ayer, MEP, we have not. She's having uh, major technical difficulties. We will come back to her as soon as we get a strong enough line. Uh, don't forget to submit your question so that I can put it uh, put a question to our three panelists, please. Uh, you can use it in the live comments page on the right-hand side of your screen at the moment. Um, Luke, to you, is there a risk that ordinary Europeans will tell their elected officials and tell their ministers and tell the commission that they don't want to prioritize climate change projects, they just want jobs, they just want work, and that the climate change agenda will fall down the pecking order? Yeah, from the side of the commission, we don't see... Uh... A um, uh, contradiction between uh, growth and and the green and, and climate objectives. Uh, indeed, I mean the, the whole logic of uh, uh, the agenda that was brought forward uh, by this uh, commission uh, for, for for some time now is, is to reconcile these different objectives. And we came up also with a conceptual uh, uh, framework uh, around the term of competitive sustainability. So I had to combine uh, productivity, uh, uh, environmental concerns, fairness concerns together with uh, the need for a stable uh, public finance and uh, banking system. This should come together to produce a sustainable uh, growth that is more aligned with our uh, longer term priorities. Uh, you've seen uh, ideas and proposals for the Commission to move towards a climate neutral uh, continent uh, by 2050. Uh, the Commission is working on uh, revised proposals for carbon reduction uh, uh, emission, uh, reduction of carbon emissions by 2030. So this agenda is ongoing and, and uh, around the European uh, Green Deal, there's a lot of activities uh, that are uh, driving the work at European level. Clearly in the recovery plan, we want to uh, use the opportunity to move ahead with the twin transition of uh, green and uh, digital uh, transition. And, and we, we will focus very much on, on climate priorities. And there's a lot of uh, investment opportunities there. Uh, it's also a chance for member states to uh, transform their economies and, and create uh, new sources of job. So again, we, we, we will uh, put the focus very much on, on the green priorities. Uh, that is already what you see uh, in what we have proposed. Uh, of course, the follow-up to the recovery plan will be uh, to discuss with uh, individual member states what their priorities are. Uh, a large uh, chunk of the money we, we envisage uh, would be funded through a new instrument called Recovery and Resilience Facility uh, that would imply uh, member states coming forward with uh, their own plans, devising their own strategies, and uh, this should be part of a dialogue uh, at national level with all actors, but also together with the Commission to make sure that we focus on the right reforms, on the right investments. Okay. Luke, 
I hear what you're saying about investing in digital and in green. I hear that. But the vast majority of jobs that have been lost over the last three months have not been in digital or in green. They have been in so-called traditional sectors, um, hospitality, tourism. What do you say to those people who hear a lot about investing in the kind of technology that is of no relevance to their lives? Luke. No, they, they, I mean, for the sectors most affected, there, there are some, uh, I would say, emergency measures being taken. Uh, and and uh, indeed, are you right to say that certain sectors will be much more affected uh, than, than others? And this is very much uh, discussed with individual member states and indeed with individual regions, how existing instruments can support uh, the, at the current juncture. I'm thinking of a structural funds in particular, which play a, a huge role on the ground already. And indeed, in the device of the future plans, uh, recovery and resume plans, we can also identify a number of priorities. In every crisis, uh, perhaps the, there are not so many opportunities or good things about crisis, but in a way, uh, crisis, crisis should not be wasted. I mean, we remember uh, 10 years ago during the great financial crisis, the way the construction sector uh, collapsed and how important it was at the time to try and move on to new types of activities such as uh, refurbishing of buildings, uh, use the skills of this sector, use the skills of these workers to move on to new activities that were very much needed. So this is the kind of uh, transformation that we will be uh, seeking for and which we need to, to support. Uh, you're right to say far that in the case uh, jobs are lost uh, in more traditional sectors, there's a huge need for uh, reskilling assistance for job search. Uh, this is why a number of new instruments are also being created. I'm thinking of a just transition fund, which is also a way to accompany sectors, regions most affected by the, the green transition to find a new path. So uh, it, it's never easy, but uh, there are ways, there are instruments uh, to, to, to try and uh, tackle the issues you mentioned. Okay, thank you, Luke. I'm, just to let you all know, uh, those of you who are worried about uh, Valerie Ayer, uh, from the European Parliament. Uh, she is rebooting her computer uh, and she's had a few technical issues on her side. We have not booted her out, let me stress. Uh, I've got a question from uh, some social media. I'm just going to put it to uh, Thomas, if I may. Um, a citizens' assembly, in, I would have put this to Valerie, I need to stress, because it's related to France, but uh, she has gremlins on the line. Uh, a citizens' assembly in France just concluded its deliberations on the climate change debate. Do you think there is scope for something similar at an EU level to enable citizens to shape the EU's response to the COVID crisis? A citizens' assembly, we have seen them in the Republic of Ireland, we've seen them in Denmark, we've seen them in Australia. Um, they often produce some very interesting perspectives. Or do we have Valerie? Valerie, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear. Sorry, I apologize for this technical problem. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. I, I, your colleague said that you had to nip out and make a cup of tea and a cup of coffee. So we understand <laughs> that. Uh, we, we would love to. Uh, anyway, now that you've had your break, uh, let me put that question that I've just uh, we've just got from social media. The uh, Citizens' Assembly in France has just concluded talking about climate change debate. Is there a need for a Citizens' Assembly at an EU level so that ordinary citizens can shape proposals at an EU level or a Europe-wide level to the response to the pandemic? Valérie. Absolutely. On uh, what's about the Green Deal issue, we can't consider our response without uh, reg regarding the EU level. And uh, green has to be the new growth. That's clear. Uh, we should transform uh, uh, the economy in a smart way. Um, Commissioner Vestager uh, made a very, very good point uh, some weeks ago uh, during an exchange of, um, uh, of uh, views we had. Uh, she said, there is no sense uh, in rebuilding the, the former world and then to tra transform it. Let's transform it right now. And really, on the agenda of, of the Commission, and uh, that is a, a, a shared agenda, there is green deal and digital. And green and digital investment will be the two metrics of the recovery. That is a very, very important uh, uh, issues for national, uh, on a national views, but of course, on a European views. 
Now, you are part of President Macron's um, Renew group in the Parliament, and President Macron, along with uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, proposed the recovery fund. I have asked the question already to uh, Thomas about the frugal four and the desire that most of the 750 billion euros be in the form of loans. Would it make a difference, do you think, in the European Parliament if most of the recovery fund were in the form of loans? We need, we need grants. That is absolutely uh, important. Uh, now is the time for solidarity. And we know that uh, loans have, they have been used and it was necessary, of course, but now we have to, we need invest um, grants, we need to invest to use uh, direct payments uh, because some member states are, are in a very, very um, difficult budget situation and uh, it is uh, uh, the time now, now for solidarity. So for the European Parliament, um, the, um, the question of grants versus loans would be very, very, very important. Okay, Valerie, good to have you back. And I'll, I'll put some more questions from our, uh, to, from our uh, audience. Uh, to, I'm going to put one to, to, to Thomas, if I may. Thomas, if you're still with us. Um, this is the, a question posted on social media. Um, which investments should be prioritized at this stage to foster a rapid green recovery in Europe? We already know it's going to be digital and it's going to be green, but which type of investments should be prioritized, do you think? I think the field of, in the field of climate, my personal view is that energy investment is going to be crucial going forward because we're never going to reach our climate targets if we do not renew our energy production. The EIB has taken quite a bold step there. Uh, late last year, we renewed our energy lending policy, saying that going forward, we are not going to lend anymore to fossil-based energy production. We, we will refocus our lending into the renewable, the type of energy production that will be sustainable. And I think we have to go through sectors and look at that carefully. Uh, one specific part is our buildings and the, the way we, we live. I think there's tremendous opportunities to do energy uh, effectivization of our buildings uh, and thereby reduce the global footprint that, that comes from that. In reconstruction and construction, I think we can do tremendous things in, in, in using new technology and investing in uh, reducing uh, uh, the global carbon footprint from our, our buildings. Do you think, Thomas, staying with you, uh, that governments will have to um, give grants for people to buy electric cars, for example, and will they have to start banning all um, petrol and diesel cars uh, entirely within the next five years? I think we've seen in the world uh, quite good examples of where governments uh, uh, gives uh, sort of very clear boundaries and they say that uh, this and this year we will stop using that type of uh, vehicles uh, this year we will give you this type of grants i think uh, uh, using uh, uh, your imagination in that is can be quite fruitful uh, we have to come to a situation finally where people can buy and 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 live uh, according to the the, the the climate goals that we have without being uh, uh, rich you have to be afford to to live in a climate friendly way and that is why i think it's important to push forward for these type of new uh, new types of investment and new types of consumption thank you thomas just to remind everyone that the hashtag if you are going to share your comments is hashtag investing in europe Hashtag investing in Europe, all one hashtag. Um, Thomas, going back to you briefly, will the EIB have to pick winners? And when I say that, I mean, will it have to act as judge and jury for support? Some sectors are very old, very traditional and not very modern, but they're very important politically. But the EIB wants to support future sustainable jobs. Will it have to pick winners? I think it's difficult in general to pick winners, but we could be uh, bold and could take uh, uh, progressive steps uh, uh, in a way that gives clear signals to industry. 
for instance, we have decided that at the end of this year, we our lending should be Paris aligned. Uh, in 2025, 50% of our lending should be climate related. So this is the that, Paris, the Paris uh, climate change agreement from three. Exactly, four years. Yeah. exactly. So that means that we are sending these signals to our clients that we are step by step sort of turning our lending into activities that are, is directly favorable for climate or is not at least damaging to the climate. Uh, and that is, I think, really important in our dialogue with our clients to see to give them a little bit of a push. What can you do to be able to take steps in to become more climate smart going forward? So that Valerie, is what, what we do. Valerie, I'm going to bring you back in, uh, assuming your, your technology is there and you can still hear us. Uh, you sit on the committee which has strong links with Southeast Asia in the European Parliament. What can we learn here in Europe from tiger economies like South Korea and Singapore? Valerie, have we lost you again? I think we have lost uh, her again. Actually, I'll, I'll put that same question, if I may, to uh, Luke. What do you think we in Europe could learn from the very successful and fast-moving tiger economies in Southeast Asia? We also saw those uh, countries, especially South Korea, uh, clamp down on the pandemic very quickly. Yes, I'm not a health expert, but I'll focus on the on the economy. Uh, a, a good lessons to learn for for everyone is is of course the importance of skills and upgrading your skill structure. I mean, we we also have a very good example in Europe. Huh? It's it's always good to learn from uh, from others, but I think it's also important to look at our, our own strengths and and somehow we we have a lot of good practices uh, and models to follow within Europe. So skills is definitely uh, one lessons uh, to learn. Then. These countries have been very able to uh, uh, move up the value chain, move up from uh, industry to uh, higher hand industry and then uh, services sector. And of course, uh, the, the importance of technology uh, in that and the combination between skills and, and technology is important for, for productivity and, and success. A lot of these economies have been export driven and, and uh, should now uh, develop uh, more of their domestic markets. Uh, in Europe, we benefit from a very large market, which is the single market, and which is indeed uh, the engine of our growth. So for us, uh, restoring the full functioning of a single market is of utmost importance. And that requires also ensuring a level playing field and achieving greater convergence in the recovery moving forward. I mentioned to you that the nature of this shock uh, risk creating imbalances, divergences within Europe. So the, the imp what is at stake for the recovery plan is a more complete or more robust or more sustainable, but also a more even recovery across all EU member states. Yeah, you, you mentioned a divide. Uh, a lot of people are starting to talk about a north-south divide because obviously Spain and Italy have been affected the worst uh, in Europe. But people are also talking about an east-west divide uh, developing uh, in uh, what Eastern European nations are doing and what the Western European nations are doing. Um, how do you find that? Is that something that's just exaggerated a little bit or is that a very real thing, Luke? Well, the truth is, I mean, the, sh the economic shock uh, brought about by the COVID uh, crisis is, is symmet symmetric in nature. It's the same type of shock that affected everyone, uh, but it has asymmetric consequences. Uh, the impact is quite different from one member state to the next depending on uh, its uh, pre-existing conditions, depending on its exposure uh, to certain sectors and indeed uh, exports in particular, uh, depending also on the severity of the crisis and the seriousness of, of the pandemics. Um, but uh, the truth is every member state is affected and it's not like uh, there is a, a glorious one and, one and others which would be totally, uh, totally uh, affected. It is a serious concern for everyone. We, we see in our economic forecast that all member states would go into recession this year yeah. uh, of a more or less dramatic scale, but it will be a major shock to everyone. Uh, in the recovery, uh, hopefully next year, uh, uh, there would be a rebound by everyone, but it would be very difficult for all member states to get back, get back to the levels it had prior to the crisis. Uh, so again, uh, it's not uh, strict lines, north, south, east, west. It's, it's very country specific, and, but the challenges, the broad challenges are the same for everyone. Um, I'm going to try and get Valerie again. She was frozen. Uh, Valerie, are you there? 
Wave, wave if you're if you're alive. Okay, she's frozen again. We have some technical problems uh, with, with Valerie. I'm going to put another question to Thomas while we try to get Valerie back. We're not having much joy with poor Valerie here, uh, I fear. Um, uh, Thomas, quick question here. Um, uh, during this this crisis, this is at the hashtag investing in Europe, hashtag investing in Europe, all one hash. Uh, during this crisis, inequalities have, have exacerbated across Europe or become worse. How will the EU institutions tackle these issues in investing in the future of Europe? Now, that is not just north, south or east, west. That is within nation states, within countries. The cities seem to be on track for a very speedy recovery, whereas rural parts a lot slower. Thomas. I think this is a central question. I, uh, there's so much economic research nowadays showing the dangers of letting a country be ripped apart by inequality. And we see that now within every European country, but we see that also the risk of that becoming true also between parts of, of Europe. And I, I, I'm really afraid of that because that sets uh, a lot of things in motion. Politically, of course, we could have uh, very negative effects, but we could also see uh, less of economic opportunity for Europe if we let that happen. So I think that this shows that education and research must be a very, very important part of the recovery. And education broadly, this is mainly a domestic issue, but I'm sure that the European Union also can take initiatives to really see to that we all over Europe invest heavily in education to be able to give a chance to come back to the labor market for those that are unemployed. The other thing is investment to create the new jobs. And here I think uh, the Commission, the European investment banks and other institutions have a very central role in stimulating investment to get economic growth on path again. That will also help uh, the services sector to come up uh, uh, with the nose above the the, the sea again. So I, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for, for the European Union to show to citizens that they really matter in real life. Uh, in practical terms, Thomas, how do you get money to rural parts? You cannot force people to re-educate, but you can make it interesting. So how do you get money when it's easier to give money in urban environments? It's not as easy to give money in rural environments. Broadband, for one reason, is simply not good enough in rural environments. And that's all over Europe, north and yeah. south. Yeah, I, I, you're absolute, absolutely right. And that is this a thing that we struggle with in each and every European country, that we have parts of our country that are not as developed as uh, the big cities. And a lot of the new economy has been concentrated to, to the big cities. But I think what you mentioned uh, already, broadband, infrastructure, I think that is really key. Strong public sectors, strong education systems all over the countries and all over the European Union is really, really key to create that type of opportunity that they need. And uh, capital and credits uh, for companies to start be started and to grow. And, and here I think uh, uh, cooperation between the EIB and local commercial banks has been quite successful. There, where we lend to banks that in, in turn lend to small and medium-sized companies. And this can be developed even further, I think. It is. Do you, Luke, do you want, you want to come in on that? Let, let, we'll try one more time to see if we have Valerie uh, to join us. Uh, but uh, she is having technical problems. Uh, she is at home. I don't know whether she's in Mayenne or in Brussels. Uh, Valerie, can, are you alive or well? Nope. I think we're having not much joy uh, with uh, Valerie. She's having technical problems. Uh, on her side all day. Uh, Luke, did you want to come in on that digital divide and broadband and investment in broadband uh, in rural parts being a key to a key driver? Yeah, so certainly. And Thomas uh, was very right. Uh, just to, to mention that, of course, uh, the EU has a long tradition of, of uh, being involved and trying to help uh, rural areas through the common agricultural policy and in particular its uh, rural development fund which, by the way, we propose to boost in the context of uh, the recovery plan. So, uh, we, again, it is uh, very important that we move ahead with uh, our proposal for the next multi-annual financial framework uh, uh, so that uh, new funds for the next generation can come on the ground as fast as possible. But also in the context of a recovery plan, we already foresee uh, a certain uh, money for that. So I, I, I agree with that. And, and like the EIB uh, has a very effective network on the ground, 
the, the EU uh, through the Commission and indeed local uh, and regional actors is also very present for uh, local investment in rural areas. Uh, and at the start of this interview, Luke, I said to Thomas, if he was the king of Europe, what would he want uh, if, he, if he didn't have to go back to voters and get permission? What would you, what additional instrument would you like to have, Luke? Uh, if, I'm not the king of Europe. Uh, I'm just a civil servant. But I, I would uh, love the recovery plan to be to be endorsed and accepted so that we get going and uh, deliver it as fast as we can. Okay. Um, I think we're going to come to an end. Uh, there are one or two uh, technical gremlins, certainly uh, from uh, Valerie Ayer's side. Um, so, uh, Thomas, you are there, so at least we can say goodbye, and that's it. Uh, I'd like to thank you both for giving of your time. You are very busy people. Valerie is a very busy public representative. We would have liked to talk a little bit more to her. We got a lot of uh, new things from Luke and Thomas uh, from the European Commission and from the EIB, European Investment Bank, anyway. Uh, so I would like to thank, thank this opportunity, might take this opportunity to thank all three of you, Valerie Aya, MEP, Thomas Oestros uh, from the European Investment Bank, and Luke Tolonia from the uh, European Commission from ECFIN, the principal advisor to the Director General at ECFIN. Uh, keep your comments coming. The hashtag is investing in Europe. Uh, the website where this will be uh, put back, I wish will be recorded and put back on uh, so you can watch it all again, uh, is investinginthefuture.eu. Investinginthefuture.eu is a specialist website for that kind, uh, for these webcasts, for these discussions. And this particular debate will be hosted there in the coming days. I'm sure you will want to watch it all again. But from me, Joe Lynham, and all my guests, thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, no flipping.